This is Coach Boyston, and in this screencast, we're going to be looking at the evidence for evolution. Now, to start out our discussion here on this evidence for evolution, we got to talk about common descent. Now, what common descent is this? If you look here on the left, you'll notice this is a what we call phylogenetic tree of life. And this was actually drawn by Charles Darwin in his notebook as he was thinking about this idea that all organisms could have descended from a common ancestor. So when you look at these trees, um, we would say this point right here, where this little number one is, would represent a common ancestor that all life on this planet has evolved from. And so it continued to evolve and then evolve this direction to become this group of organisms. All right, it continued to evolve this way to this group and so on and so on. And so we can trace all life back to this common ancestor. And so what the evidence for evolution is trying to prove is true, prove this idea that all organisms are linked to a common ancestor through common descent. Now the phylogenetic tree of life that we use today looks a little more like this. We've actually had it broken up into three main domains. We have the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukaryotes. And uh, if you look at this and we trace back, obviously these are animals, that's us. Uh, we can trace it all the way back to this point here, which would be the universal common ancestor for all life through this tree. So this tree of life here represents all the life on this planet. All the life falls into one of these groups. Now the problem as we go here, uh, the first evidence we're going to look at is the fossil record. And the problem with the fossil record is we have evidence of what we would say the tips. So the tips of our tree here, which here's the tip of the tree, slime molds, they're at the tip of this branch. But we don't have the transitional form. So how did it transition from what it used to be into that slime mold? Or how did it transition from that into an animal? So if this was the common universal common ancestor, what did it evolve to again and again and again and change to before it became that? And then what did it evolve, 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 evolve until it became that? And split this way and this way as far as it diverging on the tree of life. And so we're missing those transitional forms. So the fossil record is going to give us a lot of evidence. When you hear me saying transitional forms, that's what I'm talking about. We're missing evidence for how things change from one type of animal to another type. And so if we look at the fossil record, um, fossils, obviously, we know they're, they're deposited in sediment. They're usually going to be bony parts of animals because that's what's going to fossilize. But here's where the scientists use it. Um, layers of rock, the older rock is going to be further down in the earth. The more we work our way to the surface is going to be the newer layers of rock. And so it gives us great evidence for how organisms evolved over time. So if we look here at the horse, this is a real common one used, um, you can see the picture of how the horse has evolved here on this planet. And if you look down here to the right, you have some real uh, horse fossils. And so we have uh, this one here. This one can actually be found in older rock, those lower layers of rock. And as we work up through those layers of rock, we see these distinct changes here, here, and then that's our most recent horse. We, we know what horses look like today. And so we get the fossil record gives us a great look from the past of how the horse has evolved over time. And so, but again, the problem is we don't know, well, how did the horse become a horse in the first place? All these fossils here, those are just horses. And so where the fossil record has a tough time really showing um, this origin, this idea that we all evolved from a common ancestor is showing us and showing us where those transitional forms are. So whatever a horse was before it became a horse, how did it transition into becoming a horse? That's what we don't find. And so it makes it real difficult. So it brings up two topics that we see in the fossil record a lot. There's a lot of evidence of what we would call sudden appearance, meaning organisms appear in the fossil record fully formed all at once with no fossil evidence of how it had transformed from its ancestors. So it's just there. How did it transform and become that? We don't know. There's other organisms that we would say are at stasis, meaning once the organism entered the fossil record and we found it, all right, they stayed the same until they exit. All right, Many organisms have died through um, some type of catastrophic event. Um, they just no longer here. They're extinct. And then some organisms are still alive today. An example of that would be like this crocodile here. This is actually in rock. What scientists, a layer of rock, scientists would say is around 200 million years old. And this is a crocodile which looks very close, if not identical, to what a crocodile looks like today. So this is that idea of stasis that the fossil record shows us. 
This idea that organisms, they enter the fossil record, like the crocodile here, and has pretty much stayed the same and hasn't evolved at all. Um, another example here, this lobster, again in rock that scientists would say is about 200 million years old, um, looks like a lobster of today. So again, evolution is not taking the place for here for this lobster, at least not for the last 200 million years, as, as according to science would say, with, within this rock. And so there's this idea of stasis and, and sudden appearance of organisms. Um, but the fossil record, even with all of its holes, um, it does show a great pattern of how organisms have come to be on this planet. Um, it just, it's a conclusion. It doesn't allow us to have enough information to say without, with fact, that we all evolved from a common ancestor, although it does give us good evidence towards that. Um, another type of evidence is biogeography, meaning geography, where are these organisms located at? shows uh, that we could have originated from a common ancestor, especially within species. Um, organisms are different based upon where we find them. Um, one of the things that we talked about last time with Darwin is that he studied these islands right here called the Galapagos Islands right off of Ecuador. And if we look a little closer to those and zoom in, one thing you'll notice about the Galapagos Islands, you can see it here in this satellite image. There's a lot of greenery there on that island, this one. I can see some there here on Santiago, even the lower part of this big island. And on these islands, there is, there's a lot of vegetative growth. Well, here's what the, the large tortoises look like on those islands. Um, they have a very large shell. They're low to the ground, short neck. Um, why? Well, what's the driving force for natural selection here? Well, they don't need to find food. There's plenty of that. Look at this turtle. But the problem is, is they got to get stay away from predators. So there's a driving force of being able to protect yourself against predators. They have a large shell, short neck. They can tuck into that shell to protect themselves. And so they have evolved differently than, say, this one here you see in the top right. This one here has a long neck, long. You can see the, the back of the shell there. We call that a saddleback. Um, you can actually find these particular ones uh, up here on islands like this. You can see there's not a whole lot of growth there, even here, or this one down here. Um, there's not a lot of growth, uh, of vegetative growth. There's actually a type of cactus that grows on these islands. It's a little taller. And so for these organisms, it's, it's not a driving uh, natural selection for being able to protect yourself. It's more, can I get food? And you can see here having a long neck and long legs to stretch higher would allow you to get food easy. Uh, or easier. So um, natural selection, we can see this evolutionary taking place just through the location that organisms find themselves. Another type of evidence here is structural evidence. So when we're comparing two structures of organisms to see how closely related they are and could they have had a common ancestor that they descended from. And we have two types. You have homologous and you have analogous. And if you're looking here on the left, you'll notice you have the, the human here. You have a dog, bird, and whale. And you'll notice if you look at the bone structure of these, it's very, very similar. So the upper, these are the forelimbs of these animals. And so as scientists would look at this, we would say that the whale, bird, dog, and human all had to have descended from a common ancestor because they're carrying very similar structures within their skeleton. So where do those structures come from? Well, they may have evolved from a common ancestor. And so that is homologous chromosomes. They're structured the same. Analogous structures, on the other hand, are these are structures that perform the same function. So a bat wing and a butterfly's wing may not be structured the same, but they perform the same function. And so we can use this as structural evidence to see that, as compare organisms, did they evolve from a common ancestor? And another type of structure that we study is these things called vestigial structures. And these are really interesting. If you look here at the well, what you'll notice is, is that this well actually has what they, they believe to be a hip bone or a pelvis as well as a femur. So a very small femur. And if you know anything about a femur, femur is a leg bone. And so why would we have this leg bone here? Well, scientists will say this is a vestigial structure. What is a vestigial structure? It's a structure that is smaller in size in the organism today, but may have been amplified and used in a greater capacity in the ancestors. And through evolution, there wasn't a need for that for this well, obviously, now that it's in the water. And uh, so that, that particular structure has reduced itself in size. So let's take a look at it on humans. Um, went to the dentist. He's saying, I probably need to have these taken out right here. He said, I didn't need them. They're called wisdom teeth. All right. He said, I can't brush them. It's hard for me to reach back there. So um, why are they there? Well, they're, they're just there. They're smaller in size, something that we no longer use today, but might have been used by an ancestor. A tailbone. I don't know that we have a use for tails anymore. You've probably known somebody that's had their appendix taken out. 
And so these are all structures that, that we would say are smaller in size. They're not really used, but they might have been amplified and used in a greater capacity in our ancestors, saying we might have had tails at one point, and now we no longer need them, so that tailbone has reduced itself in size. Uh, which leads us to our next type of evidence. This is called embryo evidence. And so we can look at the embryonic development of an organism and we compare and see how closely related organisms are. We can also see that how close organisms have related from a common ancestor just in how similar this is. If you look across the top here, in these first stages of development, from a fish to a man, very, very similar in, their, in the starting of that. Now as we go through it, you can see there's a bigger difference here in the second level and then even a greater difference here. And so we could look at that and say that a rabbit is more closely related to man than say a fish is related to man, just through the development. And so it allows us to look at these uh, common relationships um, and common origin of descent through organisms with embryo development. The last one is DNA evidence. And as you look at this chart here, just so you know it, uh, what's going on here, let me pull this up. Uh, this is actually the number of amino acids that, are di that differ from a human and hemoglobin to these organisms. Hemoglobin's a protein. Obviously, we know proteins are made up of an amino acid sequence. We know that the amino acid sequence was determined by the codons on messenger RNA, which in turn was transcribed from the DNA. All right, so if there's a change in the amino acid sequence, then we know that there's differences in the DNA. So if there's not very many changes in the amino acid sequence of a protein between say the human here, which is me, and the, the monkey, well, there's a very little difference. You can see here maybe only three amino acid differences, which we know the DNA must be very similar between us and this monkey. As opposed to say the frog over here, which looks like it has somewhere around 70 amino acid differences between uh, us and them, which would mean there's a lot more DNA that is different. And so just looking at the DNA evidence, that's probably the greatest evidence for looking at how similar organisms are and then helping determine how they could have fallen into this evolutionary tree of life. And so again, this is just looking at the evidence for evolution, this idea that we have all descended from a common ancestor. And again, it's, it's obviously full of holes. Nobody was alive back then. And so we don't treat this idea of common descent as fact. We treat it as a conclusion. And this is a conclusion that we're coming to from this evidence. And like I said, there are a lot of holes in it. And so it does tell us the story of our life. It's the best story we can come up with um, within scientific reason. And so uh, I'm Coach Boyce, and hopefully that was helpful. You guys have a good day.